All modern-day anthropoids, including ourselves, owe our existence to a plucky group of early monkeys living in the Fayum of ancient Egypt. Today, it's a desert, but back then, it was a veritable Eden. Some 37 million years ago, the Fayum area of northern Egypt was a tropical to subtropical lowland coastal plain, with damp soils and seasonal rainfall that supported an abundance and variety of vegetation, including lianes, which are effectively large vines, tall trees, and possibly mangroves. Nearby streams were probably brackish due to tidal incursions, and the Nile had not yet begun to run. So the Fayum, our cradle of monkey kind, shows us where the anthropoids see their stars. Art. And anthropoids come in two varieties. You have the New World monkeys, which we will call the Platyrines from here on out, and the Old World monkeys, which we will call the Catarines from here on out. Platyrines differ from Catarines primarily in the way that their nostrils open. Platyrines have nostrils opening to the side, and Catarines have nostrils which open downward. Another key difference is the variety of dental formulas. Platyrines vary in their premolar number, while Catarines all display a 212 three over two one two three formula, meaning in each quadrant of their mouth they have two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. Platyrines today include all of the Central and South American monkeys that we love. Howlers, spider monkeys, capuchins, all of the pithecines, including sakis and bearded sakis and titi monkeys. We have the calatrichins, marmosets, and tamarins. There are a lot of different cool monkeys that live there. But if monkeys began in the old world in the Fayum of Egypt, how did they end up in Central and South America? The answer is a rafting event. Primates from the Fayum were able to colonize South America 30 to 40 million years ago during the Oligocene because the gap between the two continents was quite a bit smaller at that time. It would have taken a raft of vegetation around a week or so to reach the South American coast from the coast of Africa. We see large mats of vegetation thrown loose due to hurricane activity even today, and we see animals colonize new environments such as the bohemian rock iguanas all across the Caribbean. So this is a fairly reasonable explanation for how the primates from the Fayum would have reached South America. Today we're going to answer the question of did they do so, and we'll do so when we talk about the proteopithecids here in a moment. So there are four primary groups of anthropoids that we find in the Fayum around this time period, and they can get a little confusing, so allow me to lay it out for you the best I can. The four groups are known as the parapithecids, the proteopithecids, the oligopithecids, and the propliopithecids. The animals are a bit confusing in part because we don't know which groups are stem groups and which groups are crown groups. Crown groups are groups that exist today and can be traced back to a common ancestor, while stem groups are dead ends and basal to crown groups that exist today. So to use a reference from a few episodes ago, plesiodapiforms would be a stem group, while primates would be a crown group. We'll begin with the parapithecids, who are thought by some to be stem catarines and by others to be stem anthropoids. Either way, parapithecids have no living relatives. Epidium pheomens existed around 30 million years ago and is thought to have been a frugivorous and diurnal animal thanks to the many features seen in its orbits. It likely moved around in the treetops similar to how squirrel monkeys do today, by clamoring and leaping atop the branches. Epidium also had sexually dimorphic canine teeth, much like the earlier Notharctus, this is at least less surprising, as many catarines today have sexually dimorphic canines in favor of males thanks to their general social system and mating strategy. Females are choosy, and males compete for access to them in large multi-male, multi-female groups. Parapithecus is a close relative of Epidium and was quite similar in morphologic aspects that we can compare. It is known from one of the best preserved skulls in the Fayum, that of a species known as Parapithecus. Unlike Epidium, though, Parapithecus is not strikingly sexually dimorphic in its canines, which are large and tusk like, suggesting perhaps an alternative group organization and mating strategy. Parapithecus is also very weird because it has no lower incisors at all. Evidently, it isn't a taphonomic thing either. It's simply doesn't have them. Perhaps this is the reason the canines are not dimorphic. Maybe they were utilizing them for some insane, unique food processing. 
Bereshia thiumensis, on the other hand, looks very much like a modern tarsier, although it had the dental formula characteristics of an anthropoid primate like new and old world monkeys. It also lacks any perceivable sexual dimorphism. Proteopithecids, like the aptly named Proteopithecus, can be linked to the platyrines, those South and Central American primates, by characteristics in its post-canine teeth, so the premolars and the molars. This perhaps suggests that it was Proteopithecus, or a species similar to it, that made the rafting event across the Atlantic. Proteopithecids also have modern platyrine locomotion style of pronograde walking and leaping on the branches of trees. However, Proteopithecus boasts high sexual dimorphism in the canines of males, which is unusual for what we see in modern day platyrines. Perhaps Proteopithecus is a divergent member of whatever species left for the New World, which then convergently evolved some of the Circopithecoid traits. Oligopithecids are our third group and present something of a mystery with regard to their sexual dimorphism. Catopithecus is one such species which has been claimed to be highly sexually dimorphic, to the degree of what we see in modern day baboons. However, some have posited that instead of one single highly sexually dimorphic species, we're actually looking at two relatively monomorphic species within Catopithecus. This has happened before in paleoprimatology, so it is possible, but given Catopithecus does fall within the range of living primates such as baboons, we probably need more material. Catopithecus also has large olfactory bulbs, which is a characteristic that's usually seen in platyrines. It implies a heavy reliance on a sense of smell. However, it also has a very catarine looking facial morphology, presenting a strange mosaic overall. This has led some paleoprimatologists to suggest that Catopithecus is best understood as a very basal catarine. So this thing has aspects of its brain that look like platyrines and aspects of its face that look like catarines. You can see why this is a mess. In group four, we finally have our Propliopithecids, starring Aegyptopithecus. This monkey is considered to be a stem primate, but it is likely that our ancestor at this time was probably pretty similar to Aegyptopithecus in many respects. They're dated to 38 million years ago and are sexually dimorphic to some degree with female canines being around 25% shorter on average than those of males. Dental morphology suggests that this animal was a frugivore as well, falling in line with most primates of this time. This means it primarily fed on fruit. The dental formula is distinctly that of catarines, but the brain is somewhat small for its size and it is shown to have olfactory bulbs that are still pretty large. For a long time, it was Aegyptopithecus that was kind of singled out as this base of the old world monkeys and thus as an ancestor of all modern day apes. Although, to be perfectly honest, as you've seen, it's really impossible at present to know which of these four groups is the root. While we may not know who specifically gave rise to the apes, we do know that once the apes arrived, they thrived. The Miocene as a period of time is incredibly warm. Europe was a veritable playground for organisms that previously only thrived in warmer equatorial regions. This meant that apes could be found everywhere, from Kenya to Spain to Hungary to China. And so next time we'll discuss the Miocene, the true planet of the apes, where apes could be found doing a myriad of different things in a myriad of different ways all across the world. And it is perhaps there in the Miocene that we find the beginnings of what would set hominins apart from the rest of the animal kingdom.